Is caffeine safe if you are trying to get pregnant or pregnant? Reviewing the data today. Hey friends, I get asked every day on Instagram about caffeine and pregnancy. And in fact, you guys started asking me here. And so let's talk about it. First of all, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a fertility doctor in Austin, Texas. You can find me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD and follow and subscribe along here. I am breaking down basic fertility facts so that you can understand your body when you're trying to get pregnant or in the early stages of pregnancy the best. Caffeine is confusing. There's a lot of data out there and it says different things. So the data is conflicting and that makes this really hard to understand. So we want to take the data, understand it, and then apply that to our lives and our bodies into the recommendations that we give and to what we choose to do for ourselves. The first thing to know is that caffeine is a stimulant. So what it does, and you should know this if you've ever drank coffee before, is that if you drink caffeine, then you're going to suddenly have stimulation. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Your heart rate's going to go up. It's also a diuretic, which means your kidneys start to filter and you're going to pee more. One thing that's super interesting about caffeine is that the half-life is longer in pregnant women than in not pregnant women. So in non-pregnant women, the half-life of caffeine is about 4.7 hours. And in pregnant women, it's over 15 hours. Also the fetus. So if you're pregnant, the fetus really slowly eliminates caffeine. Today I'm reviewing a committee opinion from the American College of OBGYN called Moderate Caffeine Consumption During Pregnancy. This is where the professional association that oversees all OBGYNs gives guidelines to help their doctors understand the literature and set best practices. And so this is taking into account recent literature and it was reaffirmed in 2020 because we all know data changes. One of the hardest things to know is that there's a lot of bias in studies. So let's just think really clearly. Does caffeine impact fertility or trying to get pregnant? Well, what is your exposure and how do you define that? Is it caffeine consumption the month before you get pregnant, the six months leading up to it? Is it once you're already pregnant? Does your behavior change from before pregnant to when you're pregnant? So if I censor you, if I ask the question when you're eight weeks pregnant, is that really a reflection of what you were doing two months before you get pregnant? Or what about if I ask you to remember when you're three months pregnant, can you think back six months ago and tell me how much caffeine you drank? So these different biases, so recall bias and selection bias, in addition to small sample size of women and censoring them at different time periods has given the data a really mixed and murky picture out there. Two of the best studies on this were actually published in 2008 and they showed conflicting results. So if you want to get an idea of how confusing this topic is, they show different things. So these studies are both prospective cohort studies, which meant followed a group of women. When you can't really do a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard in medicine, meaning give these pregnant women caffeine, don't give it to these. Looking at cohorts, populations, and seeing what happens with natural behavior, as long as you're looking into the future, that's called perspective. That's going to give you the best data that we can get on a certain subject. So this first study was published in epidemiology and was looking at caffeine consumption at different time periods and the correlation with miscarriage. This was a large cohort, so over 2,000 participants, and there were over 250 pregnancy losses. The time points that were analyzed were use before pregnancy, use at four weeks after your last period, or around the time you get a positive pregnancy test, and three at the time that they were interviewed for the study, which was sometime before 16 weeks pregnant. And the Use was divided into three categories, no use, use of less than 200 milligrams a day, which was considered the median consumption, or use of 200 milligrams or more. And at all three time points, the study showed no association with miscarriage. That was the outcome of interest. So the other study was published in the American Journal of OBGYN, and what this study looked at was exactly the same thing, just in a different population of women. So in over 1,000 women, the exposure was caffeine, again in three groups, none less than 200 milligrams a day or more than 200 milligrams a day. 
in this study, what we saw was that women were censored or asked the question about their use at 10 weeks pregnant. So of the thousand women, approximately 170 had a miscarriage. So this study did show that in the high group of more than 200 milligrams of caffeine a day, there was an increase, a doubling of the risk of having a miscarriage in the first trimester. So these two studies are the best that we have guiding us on miscarriage data. What we can draw from these conflicting conclusions is this. We can't safely say that caffeine levels of more than 200 milligrams a day are, are safe, as in they don't cause miscarriage. What we can say is that it looks like in all the groups that had no caffeine intake or less than 200 milligrams a day, that there was no association with miscarriage in either study. And so in women who want to drink caffeine in pregnancy, I drank caffeine in my pregnancies, should not be fearful that a smaller moderate amount of caffeine would be correlated with a miscarriage. Now, this is a really good question is what is a small amount of caffeine? Because what I find is that what I consider a cup of coffee may not be what you consider a cup of coffee. Okay, so this chart right here is from the March of Dimes and they are looking at the different caffeine content in different amounts of foods. And I find this really interesting. To me, all the stuff at the bottom of the list, chocolate, chocolate syrup, hot cocoa mix, and even soft drinks and tea. That has really minimal amounts. You'd have to drink a large number of those things or eat tons of chocolate for that to play a role in any significance. When we start looking at coffee, but really it is your espresso, your instant coffee, your brewed coffee. So brewed coffee is almost always going to have your highest level of caffeine content. So this is a chart of caffeine content for coffee, specifically looking at the different kinds. And I think it's interesting because I know some people love their Dunkin' or they love Starbucks. So just looking at this, a shot, so what's in one shot of espresso from Starbucks is 75 milligrams. So if you get a grande that has two shots, if you get a triple, that's three. So just be adding up your content. A brewed cup of coffee, so an eight ounce brewed could have as much as up to 200 milligrams itself. A 12 ounce, which is that tall size from Starbucks, 240 milligrams. And I don't do Dunkin', but I guess maybe the small there's a 16 ounce, but same thing, it's already over the limit. So just know what you're consuming. There's also thought or looking at studies that caffeine may be correlated with preterm birth or small for gestational age or an intrauterine growth restricted child. So it appears that the data for preterm birth has not shown a consistent correlation. So we don't currently believe that there's an association between caffeine and preterm birth. The growth restricted data is a little more confounding, meaning some studies say yes, some studies say no. So similar recommendations per Assessed. And what about fertility? Because you guys know I love fertility. So this is a question I get all the time because my patients want to do everything they can to have a healthy pregnancy and get pregnant as fast as possible. And I am in huge support. This is studies from the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. And what it is is a review pulling data from other studies trying to differentiate is there an association between infertility or taking longer to get pregnant with increase of caffeine consumption. Now, I'm gonna put up a graph and I know it's really complicated, but it's one that I actually like a lot and I think it really helps us understand this the best. This graph here is showing a few different time points. So it's looking at caffeine consumption at the bottom and it's looking at an odds ratio on the side. Now odds ratio graphs are some of my favorite, but let's just understand what they mean. One is baseline risk. So if anything is close to one, that means there's no change from doing nothing. When it's higher, that means there's an increased chance of the outcome happening. And when it's lower, it means there's a decreased chance of the outcome happening. When you see the dotted lines around this, that's what's called the confidence interval, meaning data is not perfect and it can have errors and this is the margin of error. The general rule is if that confidence interval crosses one, the data is not significant and so that's not a true association. So when we look at the top three graphs, fecundity, time to pregnancy of more than six months, time to pregnancy of more than one year, we see essentially no difference. The confidence interval is spanning one, the lines are very close to one in these circumstances, so it looks like there's no change in fecundity or time to pregnancy with caffeine consumption. The bottom two graphs are really interesting. You see spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. And so as caffeine consumption increases in milligrams per day, you see an increase in that line and you see the confidence interval go up as well. And so this starts to become significant right around 300 milligrams per day. The next graph is medically assisted reproduction, which means needing to have fertility treatments. And again, just like the fertility graphs, no difference. How I take all this data is to say that this is confirming for us that if you wanna have cap being in moderation in pregnancy, there's not data to support the claim that it is causing you to have infertility, making you need infertility treatments, 
causing a miscarriage, causing preterm birth or growth restriction at doses less than 200 milligrams a day. I personally do not make my patients who are going through fertility treatment stop caffeine. I don't make them stop when they're pregnant. I don't make them stop with IVF. We definitely talk about restrictions and we do follow the recommendation of less than 200 milligrams a day, as is the conclusion from ACOG and that's also the current recommendation from the World Health Organization. Thanks friends so much. Hope this answered that question for you of why you may hear different things or people may give you different answers to the question of is caffeine safe? Feel free to subscribe. I would love it. Ask your questions in the comments. You can find more of me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or follow along to the As A Woman podcast for in-depth fertility related information. Thanks friends.